Hey everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here at the Global Tech Summit. Look, in many ways, content has always been a key part of India's soft power globally. It's nothing entirely new from the days of Avara, from the days of Raj Kapoor in the Soviet Union, to more recently, Jimmy Jimmy and Jimmy Jimmy in China right now as a metaphor for what is actually happening out there with COVID protests. India's soft power has always been there. But now, with new technologies coming, with streaming coming, with a far more globalized world, with different forms of segmentation, with the ability to take that content to a range of people who may not have had easy access to it in cinemas, is, is matters, are matters going to change further? And is this technology going to aid and assist the further expansion of India's soft power and use content as a major leverage, uh, allow you to leverage that content as an instrument of soft power. That essentially is the basic subject that we are here to discuss. Before we dive into the many other themes that we have, Karo, you want to just take a, take a first crack at it, technology, the changes that are happening, the OTT revolution. Is it, a, is it an infection point? I think, um, hi everyone, glad to be here. Uh, Vikram, I think the fact that the OTT revolution has been on for about, as we call it, for the last five or six years, and it's been growing steadily, so to say, from an adoption point of view. But the, the big jump that we all saw was at the point of the pandemic. And at that point, the adoption went uh, up quite meteorically. Um, there are many factors to the revolution being there and in India particularly. Uh, the fact is we have a young demographic more attuned to actually watching content on demand. We have the mobile phones are ubiquitous. Everyone has it. Smartphones, cheapest data in the world. Uh, and absolutely amazing content um, you know, across the board with a, with a flourishing content industry across languages. So while all that was there, uh, I think the pandemic really sort of gave it a big push in terms of increased adoption and resulted into many changes thereafter. Um, some permanent, some temporary, we can talk about them as we go along. Um, and I think the, the three or four big things that we talk about today as we look at India's soft power is, you know, we have this at least nine or ten languages. We have flourishing content industries. In most countries, you'll have probably one or two. And the fact is the amount of content that plays out from there is one part. The second is um, there is a huge domestic market. And the domestic market has, has changed very dramatically on tastes uh, you know, over the last few years, tasting content from India and around the world. And now we are seeing Indian content map up to global standards. And then, of course, there's also the point about the fact that we, in the past, never actually had high quality cinematic value content in the TV era because of the economics. But with the streaming, the economics change and what you call a targeted addressable market for, uh, for content has changed. You can actually put money behind it. You can put actually great quality behind it and, and do that. So that's the second part. And third part to me is um, the creative ecosystem here has learned in the last five years how to make world-class stories, uh, you know, which as quickly and compete uh, with, with the creators from around the world. And we have two of them here who can talk more about it. So I think with the addressable market, with a rich, robust ecosystem overall learning quickly, and all the tailwinds, I think we are in a good place right now as an industry, and we are only getting started. Right. I, th I think that, that sets the stage for what we're going to be talking about. Nanjad, the point I was making about, to some extent, it's always happened, soft power. Uh, when you look at India's influence globally and at the diplomatic stage, is that soft power an important part of it? Yoga, food, local content, great movies, great music. Absolutely. And I think it's even more about what could be in this era where, as you know, Gaurav was talking about younger people uh, with more access to this kinds of content, creating these new bonds that should be represented on the diplomatic stage. I think there's a great opportunity um, for India to also set an alternative way for how other industries in other markets, Nollywood, for example, in Nigeria, um, fusion even of especially South-South 
um, beyond just the Western lens that would be really in interesting for this diversity that India already as a market represents, but can be showcasing how soft power also can be about representation and that cooperation that we hear about in a very technical speak, but it's everything from fusions we're seeing, young South Africans taking uh, Bollywood dance songs and add it to the beat of I'm a piano in South Africa, or um, a young Maasai man, I've seen this in it's real time happening, um, who sings these uh, pop hits, probably doesn't understand um, a single word, right? <laughs> but he hears it and he, 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 he enchants that back. It's actually really cool. And that shows that there's that South-South element there that could really be something that propels soft power to a new plane. And there's a great opportunity to do that. And te technology is at the core of that because of uh, discovery, um, forms of content, and actually even bypassing typical copyright issues. This video cannot be found in your location. Our markets understand creative ways to get content to each other. So that does represent something different for India's uh, diplomatic circuit to think about. Yeah, that influence is actually quite extensive. I think one of my favorite Amitabh Bachchan stories is a real story that, that a lady doing the, the sort of a safari, desert safari, in the middle of the Sahara Desert, car breaks down, thinks she's going to die, finds a Bedouin camp, walks inside there and says, now I'm going to either be murdered or something horrible is going to happen to me. And she walks inside and says, I'm from India. And those people look at her and saying, India, Amitabh Bachchan? Yeah. Amitabh Bachchan? They made her sit down, they gave her a food, they kept her there for the night, took her the next day, got a car repaired and sent her home. So yes, it happens. When you're making Bandit Bandits or any other content increasingly, is, is the global stage important? Are you still pretty much saying it's a local content, let's go after the local market first? Has that changed? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so Vikram, specifically about Bandit Bandits, I think uh, you know, it's, it's a bit of both. Uh, while uh, one of the big changes that has got to mention has happened over the last five, six years is I don't think Bandish Bandits could have been made if the OTT revolution hadn't come in, uh, you know, as a cinema experience or at least been made at the scale and in the way that we were able to tell a story uh, on classical Indian music because, you know, because of the economics, because of the kind of demographics that watch uh, typical cinema movies, uh, I don't think we would have had the chance to make it. So I think the first big thing for us uh, in terms of uh, Bandish Bandits was the ability to make the show itself uh, was a privilege that only came thanks to the OTT revolution. Uh, but having said that, I think, uh, truth be told, while we were making it, we were obviously, you know, catering it to, uh, uh, you know, sheepishly, even to the local Indian markets, not knowing whether people will respond to it. Because, you know, we used to get commentaries before Amazon took on the show saying, you know, we like this idea, but why don't you make it Bollywood music? Or, you know, why don't you make it pop music, like classical music, no one is really now interested in listening to or wanting to hear. So we were like, but then there's no show. I mean, the show is about classical music. So I think when we were making the show, we were very uh, conscious and careful saying that, you know, if we can hit home with local audiences, we'll be more than thrilled. But I think then what happened after, and especially the fact that it was you know, it was platformed over 190 countries. And, you know, Amazon did such a great job of marketing it in a way that made it appealing and commercial to people all across demographics, all across various countries. The amount of love that we got for the show from non-NRI Western audiences was something that we had no idea or we didn't even think was a possibility while making the show. So, you know, when we're talking about soft power, when we're talking about uh, people, like I have white friends who went to film school who now work out to songs from Bandish Bandit, which is also disturbing at some level, but you know, that's, that's the kind Actually, of... Actually, I was just I, about to ask you that said, question. How do you work out to a song from Bandish Bandit? And they do. And in fact, they work out to a song called Vira, which is the song of longing which is of an old romantic couple. So I have no idea how this is translated, but there is definitely some connect. Um, and I'll tell you one more thing. We were more confident of the pop music because there's also pop music in the show. And I cannot tell you that there has been such a clear, clear winning of the classical music and the tunes across the board within local Indian audiences and definitely globally uh, that, you know, that came to us as a very pleasant surprise. Okay.